is now a hope that lasts beyond our days. For the one that once was buried lives again. Now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away. Praise the risen one who overcame the
But you show hope can rise again up from the grave. Abide with me. Abide with me. Don't let me fall. And don't let go. Walk with me. And never leave. Ever close, God. Gethsemane before the cross, before the nails, overwhelmed, alone you prayed, you met us in our suffering and bore our shame. Abide with me. Eternity will weep no more, will sing for joy, abide with me. Well, good morning, Soundside Church. Today we are continuing our message series through the book of Revelation, and today we're going to be in the first part of Revelation 19. So you can go ahead and turn there, and while you're doing, go ahead and uh, click the like, the share on Facebook, YouTube, however you're watching this morning. Uh, once again, just uh, express our thankfulness for the use of the building of Evergreen Bible Chapel, which is where we are meeting for worship in person every Sunday at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, maybe not the most ideal situation, but uh, looking outside sometimes during the week, I think, yep, that was a good call. Thank you, Lord, for providing. And uh, we are taking all the COVID precautions that we can. Uh, and that's a, that's a constant learning curve on the one hand, but it's also doing everything we can to make sure that people not only are safe, but feel safe. And that's an important part as well. But we're following those COVID guidelines uh, in person, uh, right exactly as the governor has said, for phase two indoor gatherings of faith-based organizations. All right, so today we're in Revelation 19, and we're going to be talking about one of the most exciting and happy parts of the book of Revelation, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, I, I don't know if you like weddings. I, I think we all go through a period of time in our life where weddings are super exciting, and then weddings are, oh my goodness, do I have to go to another one? And finally, to a, my goodness, I don't have anything better to do on a Saturday. Although, you know, trends are showing that a lot of younger couples are having their weddings on a weekday in the morning. A couple of really good reasons for that, because uh, a lot of the venues where people like to have their weddings and receptions you try to book it during the week, and it's a lot cheaper and a lot more available than trying to get it on the weekend. Plus, you know, it's kind of interesting. When you have your wedding during the workday, uh, you know who your real friends are, right? Uh, not just that crazy cousin who wants to come and uh, get out of control at the reception. 
Well, I was thinking about weddings as I'm thinking about this wedding supper thing here in Revelation 19, and of course I'm going back to my own wedding, August 10th, 2002, and that sounds bad, doesn't it? My own wedding, I should say our wedding, uh, Nicole's and mine, and certainly she and her family had a lot more to do with it than I did. But I did have at least one thing to do with the wedding. I was allowed to affect the menu. And that was a totally gracious uh, concession made by Nicole's grandmother. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I remember our wedding reception. The biggest thing I remember about that was one of my groomsmen had a long drive, and so he kind of worked behind the scenes to rush the reception and get it over with as soon as possible so he could get on the road. Remember that. Uh, I don't actually remember what was on the menu except for the one thing that I was able to change and like I said Nicole's grandma put it on there and that was buffalo wings. I know that may not sound like the fanciest thing for a wedding reception but we had buffalo wings at our wedding reception and all my friends were happy and I was happy of course you know his wedding and reception I, I was happy anyway um, but man buffalo wings that can that can cheer anybody up right? And uh, very, very thankful for that. But as I'm thinking about this, and I mean, all the food was good, the cake was good. I mean, how could it not be, right? I got to thinking about, you know, some of the wedding feasts in the Bible, right? And so since we're talking about Revelation 19, we're talking about a wedding feast, we got to think, what would they have been thinking way back then? And in the Bible times, wedding feasts could last for days, um, maybe even a week or more. Wedding feasts were a big, big deal. Now, I wanted to do this whole sidebar thing this morning on, um, you know, how much weddings cost these days. But, you know, the fact of the matter is I was a groom. I am a dad. I'm the last person on earth with any credibility to be criticizing that. However, I do think it's sad when a couple mortgages their future and puts themselves crazily in debt just to impress people or try to live up to somebody's unrealistic expectation. That is a tragedy. And parents and family members and friends, if you're listening, I think one of the best things we can do is try to encourage young couples that you can have an incredible wedding without saddling yourself with three years of debt or forcing somebody to take a second mortgage out on their home. Uh, Elena, are you listening? So I want to kind of pitch that, but you know, they did these wedding feasts for days and weeks and, and why? Because a wedding is a significant thing. And in a time when till death do us part really meant till death do us part, uh, that was significant. Two individuals becoming one, perpetuating the family line, taking in the inheritance. It was a big deal. It meant a lot more back in those days than it does today. So, you know, on the one hand, it's it's worth a feast. It really is. And what we're talking about today is worth the feast. And I want you to hear how God describes it in Isaiah 25. See, Isaiah, I thought we were in Revelation. We are in Revelation. But as I keep pointing out throughout this book, so much of the book of Revelation is not new. So much of it has already been talked about in other parts of the Bible. And this idea of a wedding feast, the idea that God and his people are like a groom and a bride and will one day join together forever, that is a consistent theme throughout the Bible. And the idea of this great end times feast celebrating that wedding is also an idea found throughout the Bible. And here in just a very, very short verse, and I, I can't help myself, I'm going to read a couple of them. This is Isaiah 25 verse 6 talking about that day. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. i got to keep reading the next couple verses because you got to hear them. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Now, there's a lot I just read that's going to, you know, it's going to find fulfillment later on in Revelation. But did you see that? On this mountain, God will make a feast of rich food and well-aged wine. That sounds like 
a good time, doesn't it? That sounds like the banquet of all banquets, like a dream come true. And that is what we're talking about when we talk about the wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, any wedding, right, especially a wedding supper like that, takes a lot of planning. And nowadays, we have people whose full-time job is wedding planner. And if you've ever been to a wedding or been part of a wedding that didn't have a wedding planner, you understand why that person is really, really, really important. Uh, it may get out of hand, sure it does, but a good wedding, especially a wedding feast, a wedding reception, has to have a wedding planner. Now, a lot of times, most of the preparations are handled by the bride because a lot of the preparations have to do with the bride. Of course, there's the dress, and then there's the bridegrooms, and then there's the decorations, and let's just face it, a lot of the stuff that goes into a wedding, the groom really doesn't have a strong opinion on probably doesn't care all that much except he wants to keep his bride happy and once again in our own wedding my wonderful bride and her family did a lot more than i did possibly because i was traveling the country for three months prior to it let's not get into that in the bible times however it wasn't the bride who made all the preparations it was, in fact, the groom. You may have heard this before. We talk about it every now and then at Christmas time when we try to explain that relationship between Joseph and Mary. But the way that weddings would happen in ancient times and Bible times was very often the, uh, the parents obviously would get together and arrange the wedding. Sometimes there was an exchange of property, which is kind of distasteful to us now. But the idea was that the wedding uh, would be made legal. The marriage would be made legal uh, between the bride and groom. And then they would separate. They would go back to their parents' houses. In fact, the groom would go back to his father's house and prepare a place for himself and his new bride. Uh, it could be adding a room onto the back of his father's house or building some place there on his father's property. That's the way things worked in Bible time. And when he was done preparing a place for his bride, he would... It could be in the middle of the night, it could be in the middle of the day, it was often without warning. He and his buddies and this giant parade of people would go through the streets to the bride, uh, the bride's father's house to get the bride and bring her back and then there would be a feast of epic proportions. The preparations were made by the groom in those days and what we find in the Bible is the very same thing. The groom is making the present is making the preparations and the groom has a time when he is done with those preparations. He's going to come back and get his bride. And I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it right now. We'll get into it in Revelation 19. The bride is the church. Okay? It's a kind of an interesting image when we think about it, but the bride is his people. No, we're not individually brides. That would be a little awkward, but figuratively speaking, we are all his bride and he's coming back for us. Uh, when those preparations are finished. And when he comes and brings us into his father's house, guess what's going to happen? A feast, a marriage supper. It's going to be exciting. Now, I want you to imagine real quick what life must have been like for a bride. She's legally married to this man. She may not know him all that well, given the whole thing of arranged marriages. But uh, she's living at her dad's house, and she may not see this man that she is legally married to for weeks or months or I don't know I suppose it could be a year or more before she sees him because they're not they're not living together they're not spending much time together there were probably some uh, you know some wagging tongues um, some uh, I don't know some motherly types in the town in the market that would keep an eye on these two whenever they were out in public the point is uh, it might have been difficult for the bride waiting all that time and I imagine that during that time, a bride might have gotten discouraged. She might have gotten discouraged as she sees other friends get married, or maybe other people start families, and she's getting discouraged. She might have started to doubt, is it ever going to happen? Has he forgotten about me? Maybe her dad is starting to say, you know, we got to go get ourselves a lawyer, because I don't know if this thing is going to happen. She could have gotten discouraged, she could have doubted, and, and let's be honest, it's, it's horrible to contemplate. She might have contemplated deserting. She might have contemplated deserting. Um, maybe there was another guy. Maybe there was somebody else who was interested in her. And, you know, he was like, hey, we can, we can get married now. I don't know why you're waiting for this guy. Lots of things could have made waiting a very difficult thing. And the same thing is true for us as Christians, as the church. We know this day is supposed to be coming, but even now we can get discouraged. We can start to doubt and we can be tempted to desert thinking that it's better to go with maybe somebody else. Uh, maybe another God, maybe no God, maybe ourselves, you know? And so in Revelation 19, God gives us three messages, 
Three messages that are designed to help us wait. Three messages that are designed to help us get to the chapel on time. Revelation chapter 19, verse 1 is where we're going to start. And here is the first message. Revelation 19, verse 1. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Here's the first message to help us wait, to help us get to that chapel, get to that marriage supper. The message is a message of restitution. Restitution. What does that mean? It means paying people back for what they've done. Now, Revelation 19 comes, obviously, right after Revelation 18, which follows Revelation 17. And if you've been with us the last couple weeks, you know that those chapters are all about the destruction of the enemies of God's people. The destruction of the enemies of God's people. And so that's why we, we read this whole, Hallelujah! God has put his judgment on, what does he say, those who corrupted the earth and God has avenged the blood of his servants. Just a reminder for you, Soundside, that Revelation was written to some first century churches who were themselves enduring persecution and pressure to abandon or alter their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of them had even been killed. And when you're living in an environment where you are constantly under pressure and persecution, you're going to start to wonder, when is God going to do anything about this? Are these people just going to be able to get away with it? And even now, some of you are watching the news, some of you are watching your social media feed, and you're looking at what we would consider to be injustice, even right here in the United States of America, against people of faith. Yep, there are all sorts of injustices that have nothing to do with faith. I will grant that. That's not what this message is about. But we do see instances where it looks like liberties are being trampled and people of faith are being pushed to the margins of society and some strong words are being spoken by those who would appear to be the enemies of the church. Now, it's not politically convenient right now for politicians to call themselves non-Christians. It's still advantageous for a politician to pretend to be a Christian. All right, that day is going to be coming to an end and people will be able to get votes in the future without having to pretend to be a believer at all. So that day is coming, and Christians might find it hard to wait as they see injustice, as they see people of faith being trampled upon, pushed to the margins of society, attacked, persecuted, even killed, and we wonder, God, what are you doing? We can become discouraged. And God gives a message of restitution that says, I will right the wrongs. I will pay back those who hurt you. I will make it all right. Those who attack you will get their just desserts. Okay? I've got my own timetable for it. I'll do it in my own particular way. But those who hurt you will pay. All right, church, that is a message of encouragement. Not that we're supposed to be sitting here thinking vengeance upon people we don't like. That's not the message you should be getting. The message you should be getting is that when we look out in the world and we see evil winning, God wants you to understand and don't get discouraged. You're going to get to that wedding. You're going to get to that table. You're going to get to that wedding reception. And all those who appear to be winning, who would keep you from it, they're going to lose. It's already on the calendar. God's already taken care of it. Which brings us to our second message from Revelation 19. And that's found in verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. By the way, the old word for Almighty was omnipotent. And if you can just hear in your head Handel's Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus, that's what we just read. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Omnipotent reigneth. That is it. That's what it is. Revelation 19.6. But the message that God gives to the church right now is a message of reassurance. Reassurance. 
Okay, once again, we're living in a world where it looks like things are falling apart. It looks like somebody's asleep at the wheel. It's making us wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? Or God, why are you not doing something? And the message from Revelation 19 is not just a message of restitution that those that God will right the wrongs. It's a message of reassurance that the right person is still on the throne. Remember, in first century Roman Empire, where the book of Revelation was written, Caesar was on the throne, and he was a bad guy. And his every whim was enacted throughout the empire, and people living hundreds of miles away could have their lives completely turned upside down because of what some guy in a palace in Rome decided to do. And it could be an honest question about who really is in charge. And so much of Revelation is helping us realize that Caesar really isn't the guy in charge. In the future, there's going to be some guy, the Bible calls him the beast. Between now and then, there are other people who are trying to run the show. And God wants you and I to know, I've got this. I'm still on the throne. The Lord God Omnipotent, the Lord God Almighty, reigns. Remember, we read it all the way back in chapter 11. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of our Christ. Hallelujah. By the way, nerd moment, hallelujah is a Hebrew phrase. It means praise to Yahweh, praise to the Lord. It's just a very simple Hebrew word. Hallelujah. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. All right. That was the first two messages. Restitution, reassurance. Let's get to the third. And this is where it gets really exciting. Here we go. Verse 7, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The third message that we get is a message of reward. And it ought to fill us with resolve. Because here's the message. The message is that God will grant the bride to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. Now let's talk a little bit about what that means. I want you to imagine something with me for just a moment. Just imagine heaven and people walking around in it. What are they wearing? Probably, in your imagination, the people are wearing white robes. And that's not some artist that made that up. That comes from the book of Revelation. The idea of saints in heaven wearing white robes is a frequent one. It is found throughout. Now, I, I want to back it up for just a second and help us realize where it comes from. Back in the early part of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, God was talking to some of the churches. And one of the things he said to the churches was... You know what? Some of you have soiled your garments. Uh, others of you have kept your garments pure, and you will walk before me in white. And the idea has to do with whether they're persevering in their faith in Christ or whether they're compromising with the worldly systems around them. And the ones who overcome the temptation will one day stand before him clothed in white. He also said to another church, a church who was so proud and thought that they could do everything themselves, thought they had no need of God's grace, he said, uh, you know, you think that you're all that and you're just, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, and what you need to do is you need to ask from me so that you can have the white robes that only I can provide. Later on in chapter 7, we found a bunch of saints walking around in white robes, and John asked an angel, hey, where'd they come from? And he said, uh, these people have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's a, a strange image, but if you get the idea that, the, that the, the soiling of the garment is through sin and worldly compromise, only the blood of the Lamb can clean it. And the idea of a white robe is the idea of purity and cleanliness. And so here we find the bride, the church, coming to this marriage wearing a white robe. Now, the, the white dress that brides wear today apparently goes back to Queen Victoria in the 19th century. That has nothing to do with this. I mean, maybe that's what she was doing. I don't know. But in Revelation, he's clear to say it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And right now, we need to pause 
all right? There's a lot more coming that's like super exciting, but I want to pause and have a little teaching moment with you. The white robe is the righteous deeds of the saints. So the question would naturally rise, do we appear before God based upon what the good that we have done in this life? And the answer to that question is a interesting yes and no. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. It's very clear that it was granted to her, okay? And in Christianity, we have what we call the doctrine of justification. The idea that God declares us to be righteous, not on the basis of anything that we have done, but simply through faith that joins us to Jesus, his righteousness becomes ours. Again, not because of righteous things that we have done. And in fact, in spite of the bad things that we have done, nevertheless, because of faith in Christ, God declares us righteous. Our righteousness before God is by grace alone through faith alone. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. But then we find, Romans 5 tells us, that the grace of God reigns in our life through righteousness, and it produces a righteous life. Now, you can't be justified through your works or through your deeds. That's by grace through faith. But those who are saved, who are declared righteous, will find that that grace of God that is received by faith alone produces a righteous life that effectively says what God has declared about me is in fact true. And here are the fruits to demonstrate what God has declared about me. Again, it's not through our own efforts. It's by trusting in God and allowing his power to work through us to produce righteousness. As it says here in Revelation 19, the white robes, the fine linen, as it says, is the righteous deeds of the saints. And so we stand there, we will stand there one day clothed in righteousness because of what Christ has done for us and because of what Christ has done through us. And that's a doctrine that we call sanctification, the process by which God, by his grace, makes us holy and makes us more like Christ. Both are true, but the one thing we have to completely avoid is the idea that we earn or deserve any of it. It's by grace through faith. Justification, sanctification, it is granted to her to be clothed in white, and the white is the righteous deeds of the saints. I, I hope we understand that because that's the resolve, isn't it? That's the resolve to say, I want to persevere in my faith for Jesus so that I can stand before him someday clothed in white. It's the promise of a reward because these white robes, guess what? There's another idea to these white robes. It's, it's a complementary idea. It doesn't contradict it. The, so we got justification, sanctification. We got the white robes. But then God, God himself vindicates the testimony of his people by clothing them in white. Another idea found throughout scriptures. And so these white robes are a proof of what Christ has done for us. They are a testimony for what Christ has done through us. And they are an announcement that God himself has rewarded our faithfulness. It's an encouragement to persevere because there will be a reward. This marriage supper of the land is a powerful incentive and encouragement to hang on. Persevere in your faith. Don't abandon it. Don't alter it. Stay fast to your faith and faithfulness in Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting. Jesus himself told a story about a wedding. It's found in Matthew chapter 22. He was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was talking about, I think, what we're talking about here in Revelation. Now I'm going to read this story here. The Bible says in Matthew 22, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. 
And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The angel says to John, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Jesus told a story about an invitation that went out, and what Jesus' story represented was the gospel invitation to believe in Christ and become part of his kingdom. But just as in his parable, people heard the invitation and they ignored it. Some people heard the invitation and killed the messengers, and Christian history is littered with that. Finally, the king said, anyone, I don't care, fill my house. And they went out and they found anybody. And when they got there, they handed him a wedding garment. You're coming to the wedding. You're going to wear the wedding garment. And they put it on, except one guy said, I don't need your wedding garment. I'm just going to come on in on my own. God, the king will have to take me as I am. The king looked at him and said, you're not wearing the wedding garment that I provided? Out. It's the same story as what we're reading here in Revelation chapter 19. The invitation. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And here are those who are invited. It's those who believe in Jesus and trust in him to save them, forgive their sins, make them righteous, and bring them into his everlasting kingdom. Blessed are you to be invited. And I should stop right here and make sure that I don't know who you are if you're watching this morning. You're invited. Jesus Christ died on the cross He paid the penalty of sin for all who repent and believe in him. And he invites you to turn from your sin and receive him as Lord and Savior. So that you can join him at that wedding supper someday. There's such a reward and incentive. There is a great future promised for those who follow Christ in the here and now. But since I mentioned Christ, we need to finish up with a slight refocusing. Here's what verse 10 says. Then I fell down at his feet. This is John falling to the angel's feet. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Hear what the angel says to John. I'm just like you. I am somebody who witnesses to Jesus. I am a witness of Jesus so that others can hear about him. That's my job. Just like you, don't worship me worship God. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And can I tell you exactly what that phrase means? That means that all this stuff we've been looking at in Revelation, trumpets, bowls, demon locusts, seals, earthquakes, wrath, robes, sickles, horses, all of it, the point of all of it is to exalt Jesus before your eyes. That's the point of all of it. All this prophecy, everybody gets excited about Revelation. Oh, we're going to do Revelation. We're going to find out about the end times. We're going to find out how close we are to the the return of Christ. We're going to find out, you know, who the Antichrist is. We're going to find out about all these signs of the times. Prophecy is about fixing your heart and your eyes on Jesus so that you can bear witness to who he is and what he has done. The whole point of this prophecy is to strengthen your faith in Jesus and equip you to tell others. That's the whole point. Even this marriage supper of the Lamb, you're like, oh, it's going to be great. What's heaven going to be like? And we'll find out what heaven's going to be like. But the point of finding out what heaven is going to be like isn't so that you can sit there and have this trivia knowledge, or isn't so that you can sit there and have these escapist fantasies. It is so that your faith can be strengthened and you can share it with others so that more and more people will know about Jesus. That's the point. That's the point of all this. You know, I think about, again, I go back to our own wedding. And I tell you, I promise, I don't remember much. I don't remember much about our wedding. Part of it was because we had commissioned a guy to write a song for us, and I was going to sing it to Nicole, and I was trying to make sure I memorized all the words. That, that was part of it. But I, I don't remember what people were wearing. I don't exactly remember everybody that was there. I don't remember what the preacher said. You know why? 
because my eyes were focused on Nicole. I, I was focused on my bride. That's all I cared about. I, I'm flattering myself. I think she probably thought the same thing. And since we're talking about a wedding between Jesus and his people, where are our eyes fixed? A bride and a groom only have eyes for each other. You know, we can get tempted to be discouraged, to doubt, or even to desert. But the messages of Revelation 19 are, are, are here to tell us, hey, don't get discouraged. I'll pay him back. Don't doubt. I'm still on the throne. Don't desert. There's a reward waiting for you. But more important than any of it is our love for Jesus and his love for us. That is really what this is all about. I, I don't care if you're a, a post-tribulationalist or a pre-tribulationalist or a mid-tribulationist, a post-millennialist, pre-millennialist, amillennialist, pan-millennialist. I don't care. As long as you use the book of Revelation to strengthen your faith in Christ and his love for you and your love for him, I'd say you're on the right track with this book. The goal is to meet the Lamb himself and never lose sight of him. And so that's where I would encourage us to strengthen two things as we wrap up this message. Number one, let the marriage supper of the Lamb and your focus on Jesus himself strengthen your confession. People ask you what you believe. People ask you about your faith. Featured front and center to the answer to that question should be Jesus himself. I'm sorry, I don't mean to criticize, but when I ask people about their faith and they tell me they believe in God, I, I don't know what that means. I mean, I believe in God, sure. Satan believes in God. I just <laughs> That doesn't necessarily mean anything. And I understand that a lot of times people who say that are a little bashful about getting too particular. They're afraid of sounding intolerant. They're afraid of sounding too radical. But I don't think for one minute that my bride was ever ashamed to tell people who she was marrying. And I certainly wasn't ever ashamed to tell people who I was marrying. Let this focus on Jesus. Strengthen our confession. Begin your confession. When you explain your faith, and I mean this, when you explain your faith, begin with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, nailed to a cross for you, risen from the dead, coming again to reign forever and ever. That make, may make you sound like a lunatic to somebody, but it only makes you sound like a lunatic because they don't know how wonderful the person is that you believe in. Let it strengthen your confession. And then let it empower you for your commission. Jesus said, all authority is mine in heaven and on earth. You go make disciples. Go find people in every nation under the sun and teach them to follow me. As wonderful as it is, and I do mean wonderful, Jesus hasn't called us to go build houses for people. Jesus hasn't called us to dig wells in Africa. Jesus hasn't called us to operate soup kitchens, and these are all wonderful things, and there are good reasons why we should and could be involved in them. Jesus has called us to help people follow him. Not go to church, not pray a prayer, not read their Bible. Again, good things that we should and could do. But to follow him. He's the lamb. He's the groom. He's the focus. He's the point of it all. And Christian, let us be Jesus people. May people know us as Jesus people. And maybe when they see how wonderful he is, maybe they'll become Jesus people too. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word, for these messages of encouragement. And I pray that you'll get us to the chapel on time, Lord. I know it's going to be your timeline, your calendar. We'll get there when, when it's time. In the meantime, Lord, remove our discouragement, remove our doubt, remove temptations to desert. Father, keep the church faithful. Keep our eyes fixed on you. May our love for you grow every day as we learn a little bit more about how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.